Hello and welcome to Research Software Hour number something or the other. 19. 19. Wow, okay. First yeah. from 2021. <laughs> Is it so? No, second. Is it? Oh, second, yeah. yeah. We did one. Yeah. Second, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, today we're here to talk about shell, like bash shell tips and tricks. So not just bash, but all the things that help us dealing with the command line. And these are not just the basics, but they go to sort of our intermediate or advanced ideas we use for a good working environment that just generally makes life easier. Maybe we should is, it really, is it really advanced or is it something that will save you a lot of time? I mean, it's not complicated mm. in that sense. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. I it's mean, tricks. Yeah. Okay. Tricks, but not, not difficult. If you can put yes. it that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe we can also later say something about why we, why we like the shell and, oh, when we use it and why we recommend it. But maybe first let's do an introduction round. We have a guest today. Yeah. Yeah. So super happy to have Roberto with us, on the call who will uh, tell us something about Nix and DeerEnv and Fish and some other tricks. Yeah. Roberto calling in from Stockholm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to say a sentence or two. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's, a, it's a bit funny that this is the first time I, I join either like as a guest or actually attending, even though like, a lot of the episodes like most of the episodes so far were recorded at the place where I used to live. <laughs> yes, yeah, we shall flat for like one year. So I'm in, in the recording studio, it's so, you know, Roberto's former flat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, happy to be here. Maybe share some of the next uh, uh, gospel. <clears throat> Maybe some people will find it useful. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not really related to the shell itself. I mean, it makes life easier under many aspects. Yeah. I, I, I so. yeah. I'm curious so, to hear about yeah. Nix myself some. Yes, me yeah. too. And Radovan, what's your introduction? Yes, I'm, um, I'm super excited about this topic. I think this is really a topic for everybody. So I was really looking forward to this since a long time. Um, calling in from Tromso, it's been really cold today, but super nice, super sunny. How uh, cold has it been there? What's the coldest it's 10, been lately? May, close to minus like 17. Okay. Yeah. Um, but today was like the last week for the first time I thought, wow, it's getting a bit too bright inside the apartment during the day. So that's I, I like this time. Mm. So really looking forward to to discuss today terminals and shells. Yeah. Okay. And Anne? Yes. So I'm still in Oslo. I'm Anne. And uh, I'm also very, very happy and really excited about the subject because I'm sure I will learn a lot of things to s save a lot of time on my mm. everyday life. Because many of the shortcuts, I, I don't use many. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, I stopped to use a uh, few years ago when I had new. I had to interact with many users because they didn't really know they were really novices. Mm -hmm. But I, I realized that slowly, it's uh, we need to introduce uh, them to these tricks because mm -hmm. otherwise, they spend a lot of time. So I'm, I'm really super excited. Yeah, and I'm Richard Dorst. I work at Alto University in Helsinki, and. Yeah, I'm also excited to learn some tips and tricks from everyone else. I guess you could sort of say this is a con con continu continuation of a course we gave a few weeks ago on Linux shell basics. So we don't cover any of those things. And maybe someone can link it in the chat and we'll have it linked in the video description in HackMD. But, um, yeah. Yeah. And before we start, let's explain where to ask questions. Yes. Um, so we have this one place is the Twitch chat, but uh, there is also the HackMD document, which is linked from the Twitch chat, and you can edit this document. So on, if you go to the HackMD 
on top left, you can click on the edit button. And there you can ask questions. We will also paste in our outline, things that we talk about, even things that we missed to uh, talk about. We didn't start with the full outline because we didn't want the document to be too full right from the start. But as we, as we will talk, we'll paste in uh, topics and hints. So should we get to it? Who would like to go first? So I think I'm supposed to go first, if I understood <laughs> <Yeah>. properly. <laughs> would you like to go first? Yes, so I will show you something which is, I think, quite important for Windows users. Uh, because we most of the time we teach you um, Git Bash, and uh, we always tell you to install Git Bash, but on every day, um, we don't use Git Bash because it's maybe not that uh, easy. So I uh, maybe can share my screen. Yeah, I will um, do it. Screen two. I will first show you where you okay. should see a uh, like a browser, and you s if you search for mobile extern, I can put the link afterward in the HackMD. This is a free. Uh, something you can download. You can have the paid version, but uh, I usually this is not really necessary. You don't need to be an administrator to install it. And this is the thing. Uh, if you are a Windows user, maybe uh, you would like to have the Windows Linux subsystem, but you need to ask an administrator. And maybe they don't want to do that mm -hmm. because this is not part of the policy in your uh, university or company. So this one, you can really install it. You can take this home free version. Um, mm -hmm. And once you uh, install it, so you have to follow the steps. You will get something like this, uh, which is uh, usually it will be in my menu here as a shortcut. And you can really have a, a terminal, um, like a, a Linux terminal. But this is really mm -hmm. very much like a, a on on a Linux. So here, this mm -hmm. is to start a local, and you can uh, close this one. So here, I have this background white, which I don't really use very often, only for teaching. Uh, and you will have all the different uh, uh, aspect of a, a Linux machine, very much like a, a, a Git, uh, a Bash standard bash. But what is really very super nice is uh, you can manage different sessions here mm. on the left. And you can add new session. So here, for instance, I hope you can see. If I add on session, it will take a bit of time. You see all the different sessions you mm. can uh, add, like SSH. Uh, you can also I use very often uh, VNC or SFTP. You can even have this uh, Windows uh, Linux subsystem, which I never used. Uh, and when you add a, a new session, you need to put like the host of the machine. So usually either the full name or the address. Mm -hmm. This is your username and you can put a port. You can even have advanced settings here. If you have um, some private keys you want to uh, pass, which means once you connect to the machine, you don't really need to pass all the different details. Um, so for instance, I can connect uh, uh, to a machine here and it will pass my password with a key. You saw it very briefly. And uh, I'm on the machine like I would be uh, uh, with a SSH, standard SSH. Uh, and if you are using this uh, X11 forwarding, it's done by default. So you, mm -hmm. as a Windows user, this is usually quite tricky. If you use a uh, um, PuTTY, this is not by default. You always have a lot of problems. Well, this one, you don't have to do anything. And this is quite fast for uh, remote visualization. Um, so this is the fastest uh, tool I have found so far when I do visualization. For instance, if you use Jupyter Notebook, you can start a Jupyter Notebook and it reacts quite well. And that's uh, what I wanted to show. I don't know if there are any questions on the HackMD. And this is usually like a starting point. You can install it. And then most of the things and the tricks you will learn from uh, today, uh, you can um, do it from this uh, this uh, mobile X term. And you can install many more packages. Here you see these packages here. 
um, and you you can install uh, like Git and uh, many more packages available on these mobile XTERMs, like everything Python and. Uh, it's really a bit like a, a Windows subsystem, but you don't need to be an administrator, which is sometimes necessary if you don't have access to this. Thanks for putting the um, the mobile yeah. extern web link. Um, if there is so no questions or... I had a question. So yeah. for the x11 graphical forwarding does it require yeah. anything else to be installed to run uh actually no this is when you click on the session so i need to yeah yeah if i edit one session mm -hmm. edit session uh it will be done i think i don't remember where actually i think it's done by default mm -hmm. Uh, and you should see it, uh, not remember where actually uh, if this is, oh, it, it, here, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't yeah. see this X11 forwarding. And this is ticked by default. Okay, yeah. So you don't really have to do, nothing to do. And this is what is really nice because usually it's quite a, a tricky to set yeah. up. Is there any reason we wouldn't go recommending this to all of the users as our default? Windows connection method? Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, I think it's a bit more complex maybe than a git patch in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, that's a tool I recommend when you have a Windows machine if you are not an administrator yeah. and you cannot install anything on your own. Yeah. It, it, it saves me a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and this is for, for me what was uh, closest to a uh, Linux machine. Mm -hmm. So I, I really use it to connect on yeah. uh, every single uh, remote machine. And I guess on the right side there, is that everything that's currently open? Or no, the tab yes, bar is what's Yes, the open. different tabs, yeah. And mm -hmm. then you can close the different tabs. Right. And you can have a tab for, uh, here's it. I only open uh, tel like uh, SSH connection, mm -hmm. but I have uh, some other connection like FTP connection or different kind uh, of connection. You can even connect right. to an Arduino actually, if you want. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's quite powerful. I think it's quite nice for Windows users. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very nice. Um, yeah. and this, the excellent part, especially because that is really a struggle, yes. both for the users, but also for the like system administrators on supercomputers because they they want people to be able to connect and use X11, but it's really otherwise painful. And here it just comes out of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is compressed. I mean, this, this is quite fast. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, it, it's really, really efficient uh, compared to other. Uh, I, I tried a few other ways to do it, and it was always much slower than that one. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know about it. And I think before I recommended this, I, I simply didn't know. I think many people just don't know about it. That's why it's not recommended. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how I heard about it, actually. <laughs> I think it's because I, I was struggling. Um, I was, because I, when I moved to Windows, I really wanted to have a system uh, easy to use for everyone and not having too much to install and not being an administrator, because this is usually what uh, a Windows user is, is not an administrator. Um, there may be other if you if you know something else more powerful more uh, easier to to use uh, just let us know but I so far that's the best I found yeah and thanks a lot for the questions and also the comments on on the HackMD and the more questions the better yes that's a good point So I can stop sharing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we can learn some tricks. <laughs> let's see. I think I'm next on the schedule, so maybe I will switch to my screen and we can take a look. Can someone else be copying the stuff to HackMD as I'm explaining it? Yes, yes, I'll try to do that. Okay.
so maybe before I begin, though, we can go over the different shell options. So most of what we're talking about now relates to the bash shell, but also most relates to other shells too. So all these shells tend to share the best ideas with each other. So I use bash for my daily work, which incidentally means born again shell after what was originally called the born shell. I know Radovan uses the fish shell, and we'll talk about that some. Um, ZSH is another common shell, which I think is mostly bash compatible, um, and probably also going to some of the things I'm talking about now, but the events features may be a little bit different. So actually someone can test these things. And there's a few other different shells you can find people using. For example, there's something called the C shell or TC shell, TCSH. Exxon shell. Which shell? Exxon shell. Exxon. Hmm. I I'll put it in here. Yeah. I'll put it in here. Thanks. I never heard about it. Yeah. But anyway, bash tends to be the default most places and what most people start with. So that's what we are. Well, actually, we're not really focusing on that, but that's what I'm focusing on. Um, so some of these tricks may or may not work on the other shells. And I'll leave it up to the audience to try it on them and see what works and what doesn't work. So with that, let's begin. So my first trick is CD path. So just like we have a path environment variable, which is used to find programs to run, there's a CD path variable, which I will echo here. And uh, mm, okay, I need to restart my shell. Should I put the yeah. sort of outline above the questions or? Below the questions, or how do we want to? Oh, I'd say keep adding the outline at the bottom. Okay, good. And then, yeah. Can so you can always, so in the HackMD, you can always find on the bottom where we are. Yeah. Good. So for example, in my um, in my environment, I have a few directories where all my projects tend to be. For example, the Git directory. So I said cd path to this Git directory, and now I can do things like cd. Um, cd git intro and when it uses the cd path it prints out the directory it's actually switching to and now we see that it has changed into um git intro here or cd uh let's say manuals these are all different code refinery things so this is something i only recently started using but it can save some time when you're changing to a few common places. I think also promotes good data management because it encourages you to encourages you to clearly separate your projects and have them in a few known locations. So, if there's no questions or comments about this, then I'll go on. So next is these history aliases. So we know from previous uh, lessons, there's the history editing. So you can scroll up and down like this. So I'm using the up and down arrows, and I'm moving left and right to edit history. But let's say, um, well, there's, a, there's a, another way to do this. So let's say I'm in my home directory, and I want to make a new directory. So I do that. And now next, I want to change to that directory. So do I go and edit that command? Well, there's a better way. So I can do CD and then exclamation dollar sign. And when I push enter, so this means last line, last argument of the line here. And then it inserted that back into history. And I can change to it. So this is called history expansion. 
and I'm not sure if it's a property of bash or the read line, like the thing, if it's a property of just bash or other things, but I think it's pretty handy to use. So unfortunately, this is the only alias of this that I actually remember. So you can do other things, like for example, well, the basics are, well, let's see. So they all start with exclamation mark. And um, you can do things like, mm, let's see. Uh, so here I'm searching for intro and we'll find the last command line that included intro in it. Uh, you can and I can I can already say that um, later I will show an alternative way, which is yeah. this reverse eye search. So we will come back to that. And also one question that came up: um, this CD path. Where did you set? So I set it in my bash RC. So okay, good. All right. Mm. So basically, this is what would be in my bash RC file. So yeah, actually this intro thing here, I never actually do that because I actually use what Radovan will say later. But you can do things like CD, um, okay, I think this will work, intro, and then I want the last word of that command line. So there I go. So there's actually a lot you can do with this, which I really, so at one time I had a sticky note stuck to my monitor with all the different shortcuts, but even with that, I still never really used it and learned it as much as I would like to. So there's one thing that I do. I do, I set this shell option, which is hist verify, which is, which means that it will print the new command line before it actually runs, because I would always like to see that before I run a command which might possibly be wrong. And you can read more about this in the bash manual page, which is linked in the HackMD. Any questions or comments? So one great question that came in is so whether we could comment on the advantages, disadvantages of the various shells. Like, mm. should we use bash, should we use fish? Why do, why does Roberto and me prefer fish? Why? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we want to talk about it later, or yeah, maybe that would be a good thing to talk about at the end. I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. We'll come back to that. Okay. So another thing I do is I have a per directory bash history. So this is a new directory, so it won't be here. But let's go to say Emmanuel's directory, and if I list what's here, there's a underscore bash hist file, which you can tell if I've been in a directory on a shared system because these sometimes start appearing. And if I look at this, I can see the most recent commands I've been doing. And well, there's basically no normal commands in here. These are all git aliases I've added to my bash shell. That's quite cryptic, though. No? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I didn't expect it to be so, like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway. That's why I was saying I don't use shortcut. You understand why? <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay, so this is really useful because usually I'll change to a directory before doing something there. And sometimes months or years later, I want to know how I did something. And the easiest way to find that is in the bash history of that particular directory. Um, so this has saved me multiple times when I've had to do things. So in the hack MD, you can see the functions I use to do this. There might be some bugs there, but if you look at Stack Overflow, you can find some other people that have ideas for how this is done, which you might want to use those instead of what I have written. But that's a super good idea, actually. I never tried that. Yeah. Um, I will. Uh, I will use it. Yeah. Maybe we should look at some of the common 
other options and then uh, combine them and make because that's one. one of the most useful thing to have uh, in uh, in in for each folder to have its its own history. This yeah. is super useful. Yeah. yeah, and we will come back to that also with fish because there it's just is the default. So you have um, you have context we aware. We need to move to fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is why we will end up in at the end. We will conclude. <laughs> yeah. So we need to find the best uh, yeah. shell. So that's basically <laughs> it for what I have. So, Roberto, would you like to continue? Uh, yes, yes, I can. So I think I will show a little bit uh, fish to start, mm -hmm. since, uh, <laughs> since it was a good... Uh, it seems to be the thing we're all interested in now. Okay, so the reason, uh, I'll start with the reason why I moved to fish is because I kept losing my bash configuration, basically mm -hmm. going between new laptops or mm -hmm. Or uh, hmm. like on one cluster, I had this really cool function or something that I'd come up with. Then I forgot to put it back on my laptop and vice versa. So I, I really got fed up of always forgetting what I'd come up with. And then I heard about fish, the, all these cool features. You know, you have uh, uh, like history, um, like completion, search history while you type and uh, it colors. Um, comments that you have installed and that you don't have installed in different ways so you know what you're doing. So I tried it out and um, I don't think, I've, I mean, I only use bash on a cluster because I don't want to compile the shell for the cluster. I could do it, but I think it's a bit pointless. So I start sharing the terminal. Yeah, can I have a question? Is it newer fish compared to bash? Like if we see like the, in the history, is it something recent? It's, it's recent, yes. And um, the reason why I don't think it will catch up on clusters, for example, is that it's not POSIX compliant. So it was a rewrite from scratch of, of the shell. So it uses portions from bash and PC shell and all the others. But they decided to break POSIX compatibility to, to implement the nice, some of the nice features that they have. So if you have a script that works with Bash, it will most likely not work with Fish. And one of the scripts that breaks is if you install, for example, Intel compilers or MKL on your machine, and then you try to source those little scripts that Intel provides to, to set up the environment, those will work out of the box. Of course, there's tools that let you kind of translate on the fly a bash script to a fish script. So you can still make it to work, but um, there are, I mean, there are gotchas with it. Okay, so this is how my terminal looks. Um, I'd prob I probably need to, to make it larger so that everyone can read. So the, the, the configuration of the, of the um, of the prompt that that's not fish. You can do it in fish, but uh, I found this other tool, this which is called Starship, which is much more flexible. So, but that, so this is not part of fish. So what what I was saying is that whenever I start typing something, it will search in the history. So the whole history it can be per directory or global. I don't know exactly how it does it, but. Um, so CD, and it suggests maybe you want to go to downloads because that's the last place I've been, but may I want to go to the workspace and that's where I keep all the Git repositories. And then the last one that I visited is this one, uh, the press, that's not what I want. If I press tab complete, it completes only the first part of the suggestion. And then maybe I want to go to, uh, I don't know what I have. So. Maybe I want to go here and now the color changed and there is no more suggestion. That means that uh, that folder there, uh, works, workspace slash something does not exist. So even if I type complete, I cannot type complete because it's not there, but I can have the visual cue that, that there's nothing there. So if I delete and start typing again, then the suggestions come up. Of course, I can try to type complete and, and see whatever is there. Now let's go into this folder. And then whenever I complete, I get a new suggestion. What was the last place under this folder that I was, that I was in? OK. 
okay? And then if I mistype a command and it's not installed in the system, it's in red, and then I get suggestions, maybe you want to install it and so on. So basically, I've become very uh, lazy now that I use fish. So I've, I've, uh, I've, I guess I've forgotten everything that I've learned about Bash, but the, the reverse search in history, because everything is embedded in fish. And note that I, I do not configure the shell at all anymore. So I install fish and that's it. The only configuration is the prompt because I like it when it's all colored and uh, and nice like that. So uh, one other thing that I can show, if I go deep into into a folder, for example, what it does by default is is abbreviate um, like the first um, parts of the of the tree that I've traversed. So instead of being workspace slash, it's just W and so on. But yeah, okay. <clears throat> So this, this is what I'm going to say about fish. Radon maybe uh, will add more. So um, I've never looked back on all the other shells, so Z shell or, or Bash or the others, because this does the job and it, yeah, it, it works really well. Um, so I'll stop sharing this and start sharing the binder notebook because I prepared the binder notebook if I can find it. Oh wait, wait, no. Um, so the other thing that I want to talk about is another tool that I basically use every day. She's called Nix. And again, if I can make this window larger, not this one. I'm having a bit of trouble with the with the windows on my system. So okay, so this one. Okay, so this is a command line um, tool um, package manager. A bit of everything that I started using in 2017. So I've prepared this binder. I think there's a link in the hack and the so you can try it out and. Oh no, binder not found. Okay, wait. Well, this is embarrassing. Um, I think it needs to reload. Should we start a commercial? Not yeah, maybe. Do you want to tell I us guess, what binder I guess is? I guess didn't, I didn't click on it and it. it kind of died. Um, yeah. Well, okay, so this, this tool that I'm going to demo now is, is um, a package manager, which I use to, to get isolated development environments. So if you're, if you work with Python or um, Rust or Ruby, you, you know that each have their own package manager and you can use it to, to create isolated environments. So in Python, you have, for example, pip. In Rust, you have cargo. For many other languages, these tools do not exist, or they've been slowly developed in the past years. But, well, they're, they all have problems. And by problems, I mean, in Python, if you want to, for example, use a package that is a C++ uh, component, then it's hard to make sure that all the libraries that that component needs are in place with your SPIP. You need something else. And that something else usually is the system package manager. But that means that you have, for example, one global version of GCC, and maybe that package doesn't work with the latest GCC or the GCC that Debian gives you. And you need to install the latest one, but it's really hard. So how do you solve that problem? So this is what Nix was created for, essentially. And um, it, is, it, it, it is a bit weird in the sense that it's a package manager with its own programming language. So um, this is a really short introduction. So in this little um, 
binder, what I put in is this um, folder, MKL sample. So this is a short project, uh, a really small project um, C in C++ that calls DGEM, so matrix, matrix, multiply in C++, and it works with MKL only. So I put the CMake list and the source file. So what I want to do now is to compile it. So the first thing that we will note is that I don't have CMake installed, okay? And also I don't have MKL installed anywhere. So what we can do with Nix is say, I want to open a shell within this shell where I installed the packages I need. So CMake and uh, what was it, MKL. And what Nix shell will do is to ask the central cache online to get those packages, pre-compiled packages, and then spawn a shell. Now, since I'm installing MKL, this will take probably a few minutes, three, four minutes. And so this is not unlike pip, because with pip, if you have a wheel uh, in the in PyPI, in the package index, it will be downloaded. Otherwise, you can get the source um, uh, distribution and use that. Uh, Nix works in the same way, uh, meaning that there's a cache with uh, pre-compiled packages, uh, and this cache is updated quite, quite often. But you can also uh, change every configuration of a package that you want to build. So if you want to, for example, build CMake with specific um, options, you can do it. You can tell Nix Shell to modify the way that CMake is built, for example, or GCC or any other dependency that you might imagine. So it combines the two things that you can have a binary distribution, but you can also rebuild locally. So this is um, powerful. Yeah. And now that uh, MKL is installing, when I tried so, it this afternoon, it was much faster. So I don't know. Uh, so the the if I understand properly, it's a bit more than a simple package management system. It uh, does a bit more, no? Because you have this local does, compilation. It does a lot more. <laughs> yeah, OK. Sorry. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> So Nix is the package manager, and on top of that, there's a whole operating system built, mm -hmm. which is called NixOS, which is the one that I'm actually running, and that I've been running since 2017 without changing the configuration. And they also have a thing called Hydra, which is a continuous integration manager, which uses this idea of having a pre-built cache um to to i mean yeah i've never used hydra but it's a bit more than just the ci okay so now we are in the shell yeah so you see that the prompt change and now if i type cmake now i have cmake okay and now it, i didn't specify the version and it gave me the latest version okay but i can ask for any previous version as long as um, I'm willing to wait for it to compile because all very old versions you can still get them, but they're not in the cache. Maybe uh, maybe it was said before, oh, but what is so beautiful about this is that you can install anything you want without being an administrator. Mm -hmm. So it's per yes. user per user installs. So, so all the installs and yes, and so in a way this is like Conda if you're familiar with Conda because that also you can install per user. But I think the key difference with Conda and the reason why, in a way, Nix is done the correct way, uh, double quotes, is that whereas every user can install packages through Nix, all the packages live in uh, the same location on the system. So there is mm. a thing called the Nix store, which is in mm. under slash Nix slash store. And these are all the packages that have been installed on the system. So if uh, another user on this machine, well, now it's a binder instance, but imagine mm -hmm. on, on a cluster. Another user wants to install MKL, they can get it from the cache, uh, from the local store. So it will not be installed twice unless, I don't know, they want to configure it in a different way or they want a different version. So, and whenever you use a package, it's, it's, um, 
Um, it's a symlink. So you, you're working through symlinks and um, this avoids that you install the same thing over and over again and saturate the disk, disk, uh, mm -hmm. disk space. So now that I have the dependencies that I need, I will run CMake. Okay, this was just as an example. So now this thing configures and I have all the dependencies. I can build the code and test the code and whatever I want to do. So there it is. And if I quit the shell, uh, then CMake is not there anymore. MKL is not there anymore. And that's it. If I want to jump back in the shell, I, I should I can do the same. And now this will be immediate because the dependencies are there. So I know that the, the shell has been cached. And the cool thing is that um, so in pip you have requirements.txt where you specify the, the requirements. You can have the same here. And that file is called the shell.mix. So what did I install me of him, I think? So this is super nice to have completely isolated environment mm. for like yes. reproducible uh, research. Um, so now um, that's nice. Never heard about it before. <laughs> the 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 thing with the shell dot mix, as I said, is that now um, you you need to learn a completely new language, which looks a bit weird, <laughs> and I'll show you now. I'm copy pasting uh, this example, huh? So, um, um, <clears throat> and I just write down what we used in this shell. So it was packages.cmake and packages.mkl. And I'll explain. So you describe that you want to build a shell. So this is this command make shell, which takes a list of build inputs. Mm. So in here, the inputs are the uh, CMake and MKL package. So this PKGS uh, is the package set, and the package set can come from anywhere. So and anywhere means that it can come from the the central distribution, which is called Mix Packages. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm giving to this script the package set Mix Package as um, as as an input. Okay. But it can also be a um, package set that I've defined locally or another version of the package set that can be back in from 2017 or the unstable version at the, at, the, at the tip. So it can be either the latest of everything or versions from a long time ago. So um, the language looks weird because, as I said, Nix is, they call it the purely functional package manager because everything you do is written in terms of functions. Um, so this packages make shell is a function. And to call a function in this language, instead of using uh, parentheses, you use curly braces. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a function call in the language. This is a list with the, with the square brackets and packages itself um, is is uh, an attribute set so it's like a dictionary so yeah so now that we have the shell.nix instead of calling nix shell with a list of packages explicitly i can just call nix shell like that and it will load the, the little script so the requirements.txt and put me into a shell, which is what we did before. So one thing that I did not install in this case within the shell was the, the, the C++ compiler. So the compiler that I used in the shell and outside the shell is the one that is installed in the machine. So if I want, I can, I can um, I can open the shell with this dash dash pure. So this will mean that whenever I get into the shell, I have nothing. So this is completely isolated. I don't even have an internet connection. So I, I can't call curl from a pure shell because that, that would be um, a side effect if I downloaded something or sent a request. 
So if you want to be extra paranoid about your dependencies and really check that, that you have packaged everything correctly, you can use uh, a pure shell in Nix, which will really show your um, like uh, your assumptions uh, when, when you try to build your software. So um, now to build on top of this, uh, we've seen that, um, so what I do uh, day to day is to have this little file shell.nix in every project. And then in principle, you need to call Nix shell by hand anytime that you jump into a project and then remember to um, jump out of that shell, go to another folder, um, open a new shell because once it's activated, if I go back one, I'm still in the shell. Okay. So the shell does not get activated and deactivated automatically if I go to a place that doesn't have the little script that specifies the dependencies. So what to do? Um, there is a little tool called DRAM, which does that exactly for me. So DRAM is not just to be used for Nix, it's to be used any time that you want to have a specific environment for a specific folder. So you can- And it's have, part of Nix, it's a, this, is, uh, this is really I part? Think, I think it really came to prominence once Nix became to be, mm. came to be more used, but it existed from before. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So what you do, you write a little .mrc file, so a hidden file in the folder. Okay, I have new vim, not vim installed. And here I will say that I want to use Nix. So that's that's the only thing that I write. Uh, and then um, I do DRAM allow. I think I forgot. To <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I forgot to uh, set it up. Uh, who was it? Um, I, I need to <laughs> I need to check uh, the documentation. Mm, hook the end into your shell. Yeah. Okay. So, so the thing that you just copied this is something we need to put into the like bash RC or typically. Uh, so there is this little eval command, mm -hmm. which you are supposed to do immediately after installing the RAM, but which I forgot to put in the configuration of the binary. Okay. So, okay. So now I'm outside that MKL folder. I'm just clear. So I'm in the in the in the home, PWD. Yes, home Jovian. And now I move into the sample folder. So what happens is it says DRAM loading d.mrc, then it meets that use nix command, and it will call nix shell for you. So and then update the path inside so that everything that was set by the shell is is set in this folder. Mm -hmm. So now cmake minus minus version works, and if I jump back uh, home. DRAM unloading and mm -hmm. CMake minus minus version. It's not there. So now whenever I go into the project that needs CMake and MKL, I have them. And whenever I jump outside, they're not there anymore. So you have like per folder environments without without yeah. needing to activate them because they activate themselves and deactivate themselves. Right? Exactly. That's and super cool. Yeah. And this is not just for Nix, as, as I was saying. Uh, I'm trying to market uh, Nix a lot because I like it, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not just for Nix. So it has a thing called the, um, a, standard lib, a standard library for DRAM. And the .mrc, it's important to note that you can put anything that is valid um, bash inside. So you don't need to use just Nix or pip or any of these other things. If you want to set your own environment variables in a given folder, you can do it there. Uh, and if you look at this standard library, it's a set of functions that you can use with these package managers, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, so there is 
uh, use nix and then let's see let's search for use something uh, okay use Julia I didn't know it must be new in this version uh, use rbm uh, node there definitely was pip because I was using it for a long time um, you can load per folder bmrc it's it appears uh, there was uh, use pip oh maybe they removed it maybe it was uh, layout oh, okay so documentation is not great okay so you have this layout go uh, um, mm -hmm. layout and the name of the language which will uh, load uh, virtual environments i you. see and these functions as you see they're bash functions so you can add your own to your own local library and dram is in itself written in go and that is that is unimportant except for the fact that you can be sure that you can download the pre-compiled binary and just put it on a, on a cluster and it will work because it will depend only on on the on glibc on the c library so this thing um unlike fish i can really suggest that you can include in your own um, workflow even on a cluster because you can download dram and that will work on your profile without having to to bother the system administrators mm -hmm. And this will probably make your life a bit easier because most of the time, like on a class, you need to load modules for a specific project. And I used to have these functions like this that would load certain modules that I could call whenever I was in a folder to compile a certain project. But you can, you can actually just have it within the folder without uh, polluting your global bash RC. This is actually super nice. We should uh, suggest people to use that on a yeah. cluster. Um, have yeah. you, have I you mean, I think this is rather small uh, tool, like unlike Nix or Fish. So Nix is very nice, and I think it could work on a cluster too, because it's much more flexible than easy build. You know. Yeah, it looks much easier when I was looking. And there are many packages. I, I'm looking at this NX uh, store. It's quite a lot. Um, I think as number of packages goes, it's the, uh, the this Linux distribution with the largest, probably, mm -hmm. because they don't have, uh, unlike Debian or Fedora, they don't have to be really conservative with what they can allow inside their curated package distribution. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you can, as you manage to write one of these expressions, you can build it locally. You don't, and then you can share it with your friends. You don't even have to go through the central repository. You can have your own repository of packages and mm -hmm. build from there. And one will will shout at you. While if you want want to do that with Fedora or Debian, you cannot really do that, or it's harder. So the the sharp bits of um, Nix because I mean, I'm, I think I'm overselling it uh, now, is that uh, it might be a bit hard to work with uh, languages that already have their own package managers. Mm -hmm. And by this, I mean, the, the experience with Python is not exactly great. So there is a lot of work that you need to do to install packages from PyPI, for example. And that's because um, yeah, many reasons. Um, it's it's not easy to make sure that uh, so uh, that the build of a package that you download from PyPI is always reproducible. Um, so yeah, you sometimes you need to repackage those stuff to work mm -hmm. with Nix. So that that that's that that makes it not that great. So, but for C++, if you only work with compiled languages, then definitely um, use Nix because that makes reproducibility much easier to attain. Okay. Yeah. So I think I went uh, quite uh, 
over time with the with the demo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But thanks, it's, it's really uh, very nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, New and, to uh, me. <laughs> yeah, and you also got a couple of questions on HackMD, which yeah. uh, I tried to answer, but you can maybe also fill in more and correct. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. And this this little binder will stay online for forever, I guess. So if you want to just demo it. Yeah, it's super cool. I tried it. It's really yeah. nice. Keep it. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the repository is not going anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. So with Duran, do you ever see like, ever see issues supporting people? Like if the behavior of the shell will differ in different direct different directories, then does it ever cause weird, hard to debug problems for users? Like you say, well, Python appears to be what it should be, but then they go to a different directory and it's suddenly different and no one knows why. That's the only mm. thing I can think of recommending everyone to use it, then it can make like huh, when yeah. someone doesn't uh, stay aware of it at all times, then weird things can happen. And if I can add a comment, I think this is really convenient for working, but if I'm on a cluster and for the computation, then I think one of which one should be a bit careful because now you have you have dependencies somewhere that are automatically switched on, but then you don't see it if you look at the run script and if you look. Mm -hmm. So on a cluster for computation, I will put all the dependencies into the run script. But mm -hmm. for yeah. for working, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because this is hidden. They don't appear anymore. Yes. Good point. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, but it's. Even uh, even with the Conda, um, I think at least with Slurm, with most configurations of Slurm that I've seen, they don't uh, inherit the the path when you when you launch a batch screen. Mm. So also there you need to be explicit about activating and deactivating. So yeah, it's kind of yeah. I mean, if Slurm is configured that way, then you have a kind of safety net against this hidden. Switch on, switch off. But so yeah, what 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 I showed definitely is like very good for developing, mm -hmm. um, for running calculations. Then maybe you have to be careful. Yeah. So just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Should we go on, Radovan? Would you like to talk about a few things? We're coming yeah, so close I'm... to an hour here, but I think we can go on. Yeah, like 10 minutes. So I have 10 minutes of stuff, and it will be a bit easier. So now we can relax again. <laughs> well, it will be something that I think maybe everybody can use. I will show a few, few things that I use a lot and which save time. And I will share screen. And let me adjust this a bit. Oop. Yep, it's quite all right readable. And I'm starting out with fish, but the things that I will show, they are not only for fish. And at some point, I will also switch to bash. But first, um, so I don't need to repeat all the nice things that Roberto said about fish. I want to only add that. As Alberto said, the only thing I modified is the prompt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing which I changed is that I did not like it, that the prompt was compressed. So I like when I go deep down into the folders, I like to see the, the full folder mm -hmm. because I want to be able to copy it into my mouse and use it. So I modified my prompt to show the full thing. Then the branch, if I'm using it. I also modified it so that the path is not in front of my prompt, but above it. Because as I go deep down into the into the hard drive, I didn't want my prompt to move more right and right and right and right. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing I modified. And um, another thing that I want to show, which I really like about Fish, is 
functions. I like that aliases. So we mentioned aliases a few times. So aliases are shortcuts. And you can have them in any, any shell. But in, in fish, and I, this, this just tells me where they are. So they are here. In fish, the aliases are functions. And that, I like that. So here I have a I have an alias to remove tabs because I really don't like tabs. So this thing, um, but I like that I can express it as a function. Here I have a function that initializes virtual environments. So that's another little detail. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in the HackMD, I also put the link to my configuration. So I actually, you can you can reuse my aliases. I don't use so many aliases. There are actually very few. So similar to um. All right, but now I will go some other place. I will go some other place. I prepared some files. I wanted to show you first, first thing I wanted to show you, and that is independent of shell. I think any shell does that. If I, okay, I'm in here, we said software hour and examples, and something is in here. And I'm working in this folder. But now I need to, for a while, I need to go to another folder. And then, so I, want, I need to, for some reason, I need to go to slash TMP and do something in there. But now I would like to return to where I was before. And of course, I could do CD, CD RSH, CD examples, and painfully go back to where I was. But the short way to go back to where I was last time is CD cd minus cd dash this will bring me to the it will bring me to the folder where i was just before uh, there is another way to do that and that is push deer and pop deer so push push deer if i want to go to tmp and then i want to go to some i can maybe go to my home And it's a stack. So for those who are familiar with stacks and pushing stack and popping stack, you can put folders on a stack and then I can go back again with pop. I go one back, to, I was in TMP and I go one more back and now I'm where I started. So this is a, a faster way to na navigate if I need to jump between folders. Yes. Then, then I wanted to show you. Uh, let's look at the time. Yeah, go ahead. Mm, yeah, yes, let's do that. I wanted to show that something I do often is, um, and maybe let me show that in Bash now. Just that in 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 Fish it's a bit more compact, but I will show that in Bash. So let me go to Bash. Here, yeah, I'm. I'm. I mean, it's still in the same folder. The prompt changed. Uh, I prepared some images. And now I want to convert all these JPEGs into PNGs. And I could do that one by one. But something I do really often in a shell is for loops. So you can really loop also in a shell. And you can use wildcards. And I will now use three interesting things in one command so I will show you but it will make it will you will see what's going on so far for file in star jpeg so loop over everything that matches this wildcard everything that ends with jpeg and call it file do and now I can do something for instance I will start with echo file and done. So this for do do something and done it it looped over all the files and and prints the echo. And but now I want to reuse it. So I will do up arrow. I will turn on the up arrow to go back to my previous command. So here's my previous command, and I can edit it. And now I want to do 
I want to show you this thing, which is really useful, and I didn't know about it for a long time. You can, I want to change the JPEG part to PNG part. But oh, yes, this is nice. <laughs> so far, I will only echo. So I'm not doing anything yet. I just want to see what I will only print it. Maybe you can mention this uh, semicolon, no? For the semicolon. That uh, appears when the, when you do this loop, in mm, case yeah. people are wondering. Yes, because this, no, this is not how I typed it. I first typed this, and then on the next time line, I typed do, and then I typed. And, and it automatically inserted the semicolon. So the semicolons will separate commands. I can do echo this and echo that. I can do several things in one line with the semicolon. But now let me go back to this. And now we are almost ready because if I do, there is a command called convert that comes from image magic, but that's a detail. So I use that to convert images. But this will now convert all the JPEGs into PNG in one line. And if I now list all my files, now, now I have the JPEGs and I have the PNGs. And let, actually, let me show you one of these because this is a photo I took today from, from my window. It looks really beautiful. So that's the weather today. That's fake. No, this is Tromso. Yeah, no, this, that was Tromso, but this was real. So it was this afternoon. Um, do we have time? Maybe if you, two, two, three more commands. Do we have time for that? Yeah, why not? Sure. So something I use really often is, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I wanted to show you a command that I don't use every day. I want to use. I want to find all the files that are larger than, I don't know, half a megabyte. So I remember that there is a command called find, but I don't remember how that works. One thing you can do is pass the manual, man find. And now I can read the manual. But that I find often um, it's useful if you already know what you exactly look for. So what I use these days more often, and I mentioned it in, in a past research of our episode, is I use TLDR, too long didn't read. You, you need to maybe install it. Too long didn't read find. Because this one gives me really examples, and it's really short. And then if I want to know more, I go into the manuals. So there is this one here, find files matching a given size. This one is interesting. I want to find all the files which are larger than half a megabyte. And here they are. And great. But why did I do that? Um, I wanted to show you this reverse I search, which is, I think, the most useful shortcut command I use, which is. Yeah, I'd say of everything we talk about today, this is perhaps the one yeah. I use most of everything. Yeah. And it's control R. So control plus R. So I will, I will now type control R. Oh, and now you see that something happened. It shows me reverse I search. And now I can stop typing because now I remember that some time ago I used the command with find. I just don't remember how it was. So I can start typing find. And it will find, it will suggest me the last command that started or contained the thing that I'm searching for. And now I can edit it if I want to and then enter. Before I hit enter, I wanted to also show you that if you have a very, very long command, you don't need to do all these like left, 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 and right, 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 right. So you can do control A is the beginning and control E is end. So like this, I can quickly switch between beginning and end. So the control R really is the, is the most useful command I use. Uh, I wanted to tell one more thing. What was it? Oh, oh yeah, one more tip I saw. Uh, that some, somebody suggested that on, uh, I saw that on Twitter. If you have a really long command, 
Oh, uh, yeah, let's do this. Really long command. Let's imagine that this is really, really, really long. I call super long command. You can you can add a comment at the end. This is a comment in Bash, mm. and it's not part of the command. And here I can give a description. Uh, locate all large files. Mm. This part will not be part of the command, only this part. But now you will something really useful will happen. Because if I do now the reverse search, control R, I can search for locate all. You see what's, what's happening. I can actually search through my com comments. So that's, that's a super useful. good oh. trick, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty all smart. Right. Did I forget anything? That's probably a super useful. I will use it, this one. I never s thought about it. <laughs> Yeah. Yep, and maybe one more thing. Let's go back to fish. Just to re-emphasize a bit what Roberto said uh, about fish not being really POSIX compliant, but they have, like the syntax is just nicer. Like, let me do the same loop now in fish. For file in JPEG. I don't need to write do and done. I mm. and it intends for me or oh, convert file file. Okay, now I don't know. Well, let's do. It's different. I don't want to introduce this, but let's do end. So the the syntax is a little bit nicer. I find. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all I want to show. I would be really happy to get questions about that. And sorry for going over time here. Stopping sharing. Yeah, no problem. Well, I sure learned a lot here and got some stuff that I should try. What about you all? Super useful uh, what I, I learned today. <laughs> yeah. The trick of commenting. Uh, comments to, <laughs> to to make the search easier. Yeah, that's very funny. I think you showed I think you showed me that before, but uh, I forgot it. <laughs> yeah. I can show actually one thing I learned today because I'll do how to do a uh, reverse search in in fish. Um, if you can do this, locate. Of course, now I have a different history now. Oh, let's see. But I can do, you can start on mixer. I remember the command contained mixer, and now I type up key. Just the up arrow it, key. Just the up arrow, and it will find the last one that contained it. So I learned that today. OK, nice. Yeah, well, hopefully this has been helpful for lots of people. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to be missed any but, questions. Yeah. I think we've answered most everything. Oh, yeah, well, there was one more question that came up, and that was we were asked, how do we synchronize these across computers. Did we did you answer that? No. No, I don't think so. Yes. Oh, OK. Oh, just sorry for taking yeah. a little more time. But I wanted to show how I, so I keep my configuration on GitHub. And, oh, and then I have a script which creates, so here are my aliases. Mm -hmm. This is a bit home cooked. Oh, there are more fancy ways of doing that. So there is, if you search for dot files and home manager, these are more fancy ways of synchronizing your home environment across different computers. Mm. How do how do uh, all of you do that here? So Richard and Roberto. Yeah. I keep uh, it, but I have a private repository actually. I'm 
for some reason I uh, didn't expose it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I see this is public, your repo. Yeah, it's public. The only thing I don't put there are SSH configuration. So that I keep in a private mm -hmm. yeah. because that's a bit sensitive. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I use uh, Nix <laughs> <laughs> for that tool. So there's there's a, um, a tool called Home, uh, Home Manager. Mm -hmm. um, so you can specify well, which dot files to keep track of, but also which packages to install in the user profile. So it's when I get the new computer, the the packages the packages that I install globally are a handful, maybe mm -hmm. 15, 20 on top of the of GNOME. Then everything else is in the user profile. So is the user so profile a Nix package or uh, yes, a Nix package that is uses the same syntax, so like everything is a package mm -hmm. in Nix, sort of. Mm. So and that thing basically, so when I switch to this new laptop in the fall, um, transferring the configuration to half an hour because mm -hmm. it was copying some files and the SSH keys that kind of stuff I keep separate. So yeah. I should the stuff that I cannot keep track um, in a Git repository that takes the longest time to, <laughs> to to put back in. Otherwise, the rest of the configuration is six files, six text files. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I used to have one directory in my home directory that would be synced with unison across all my computers and the most common like the config files were sim linked into there but at some point i stopped doing that because i don't remember if it was unison incompatibilities between different versions of things or one of the central computers stopped being used but i basically don't do that anymore and now I have one master bash RC file I only edit on one computer and then sync that across to all the other ones. But I really should get my syncing working again somehow. The syncing was not just my config files, but also many of my personal files like notes and stuff like that. So. So a bit more advanced than the config only. I mean, maybe it's less advanced because it wasn't, it didn't have history there. So that was important when I was syncing things like images and so on. But like, well, it was a bit too fragile, so it stopped working. So now I want to use Git Annex and I can combine both history and non-history stuff. But I haven't gotten to that yet. Hmm. Okay. So, should we end for the night? Any other final comments from anyone? Yeah, thanks a lot for watching. And uh, yeah, I also learned new tricks here. Yeah. So, let's improve our bash and shell kung fu. Yes. Yeah. To be super efficient, we have too much time now. Yeah. It's great procrastination. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, bye, everyone. Yeah. And thanks also for Roberto for joining. And, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for bye bye. This is thanks, Roberto. Bye. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye.